Good afternoon to you. Mark set of Hurricane Track here. Friday now, the 30th of May, 2025. Thanks for joining in. Got a few things to talk to you about. Three different items I want you to keep an eye on over the weekend, if you're so inclined. We have Alvin out there in the eastern Pacific. Luckily, it's not going to be a real big problem for our friends in Mexico. And then we have another area kind of related to the whole Alvin deal. This is all still part of number one, the first thing to keep an eye on. Basically, the East Pack. Then, maybe some shenanigans trying to get going somewhere in the Western Caribbean, eventually working its way into the Gulf. I know you good people out there. You've been seeing those posts, I'm sure, from different people putting out 10-day deterministic GFS runs and so forth. I want to explain it, and I got a couple of tweets that I can show you to help explain that it's not time to get worried, not even close. And then the third thing, boy, the amount of African dust that is coming across as part of a big Saharan air layer outbreak. We'll take a look at that, and then we will wrap things up, and you can start your weekend, all right? So let's get started. First of all, our tracking map, the interactive map off the Hurricane Track Insider site. There is Alvin, and what's nice about this, it's all interactive. You can click right on it. And it's starting to weaken. It ramped up to 60 miles per hour yesterday. Winds are down to 50 now. It's a large swell and rip current generator, big rainmaker, but drier, more stable air lurks along its path. The thermodynamics are just not going to be too impressive. So Alvin will eventually die away here, not becoming the first hurricane in this part of the world for 2025. It's not going to do that, but it could bring some moisture up through this region here, maybe over to more of Arizona. We'll have to see about that. Not a real big, deep, large hurricane with a huge moisture source to begin with, what we call an envelope. So the, the moisture that streams up into the southwest is going to be limited. Next, we're going to be watching another area. Seven-day outlook, 20% chance of additional development. It is the East Pack season now, so anything out here, you know, we got to watch it and see what happens. And uh, it is the start of the hurricane season, and water temperatures are warm enough. Just the thermodynamics, though, not enough to get Alvin to do much more than it has already done, which is kind of interesting because usually when the East Pack struggles, the Atlantic Basin eventually surpasses everything and kind of takes over. A little rule of thumb that I've picked up over the years. We'll see if that stands true again this year. Here's a close-up of Alvin. Now, to be you know sure, there is some deep convection wrapping in here, a little uh, maybe a possible eye wall trying to develop. Uh, a last gasp of Alvin trying to get his act together before it reaches this more stable air mass farther to the north and east. Uh, look at that little coastal eddy up here, uh, part off of the uh, Baja there of California, that peninsula. Coastal eddy. Everybody knew. We all know a coastal eddy somewhere, right? Uh, just an interesting way that the wind gets in there and creates that little local weather phenomenon. But you don't see a big, deep, huge moisture plume coming north with Alvin, so uh, not a lot of, of available precipitable moisture coming into the desert southwest of the U.S. West Texas, I know you need the rain. This isn't going to help too much with that, unfortunately. But the good news, too, I think this goes without saying, you have plans down here. Yeah, it's going to be a little dreary, a little bit different than a nice sunny day, obviously, but I think you'll take this over the likes of an O'Deal, Remember that, 2014? That was a powerhouse hurricane. Nothing like that at all. And any interest in Acapulco is still, I'm sure, shocked from what happened with uh, Otis a couple years back almost. No, nothing like that either. So uh, a problem, some impacts from heavy rain and some swells and rip currents, but that is about it. Broadening out the picture here, the satellite animation that is, there's Alvin, there's Coastal Eddie. And uh, this is wildfire smoke getting dragged down out of Canada. And then we have a front draped across with some upper level energy in here as well. Uh, and then a severe weather threat across parts of the mid-Atlantic. Just kind of pointing things out for you. Very nice out west, by the way. Pretty much west of the Mississippi, we're good to go. A severe weather threat uh, of practically non-existence out here for a little while longer. After a very busy April and May, for sure. This, though, is the African dust coming. You can see just by the cloud cover, or lack thereof, it's very stable out here. And this Saharan air plume is going to make its way into the Caribbean, spread some of that across Florida, the Gulf Coast region. 
And that's, it's going to be hard to get something to develop with that there because the Saharan air layer really does act like a warm, stable blanket. Because instability, the, the way you get instability in unstable atmosphere, to put it very simply, you have to have cold air over warm air, and those air parcels have to be able to rise. And when everything's warm and kind of uniform, uh, you don't have that unstable atmosphere. It's, uh, it's, everything's kind of trapped. It's kind of like an inversion, though it's not the same thing. But that is a big warm blanket that comes over the humid air mass of the lower part of the atmosphere. And it could be, you know, 90 degree ocean temperatures and 100% humidity and dew points in the mid 80s and all that. In other words, a lot of latent heat. But if you don't have a mechanism to get that air to rise because everything's sort of capped, warm air over warm air, that just generally does not work. There's no forcing mechanism, especially in the deep tropics. That's how you get it, cold air over that warm, moist air, and this is definitely not that. You notice some pretty strong upper-level winds streaming across this way out of the Caribbean, otherwise the trade's moving through, but also notice there are no disturbances really. This is the leading edge of the Saharan air outbreak, but that's about it. More in the way of vorticity or little pieces of energy that might try to come together in the southeastern Pacific, but... It's only May 30th. We're not really looking for strong tropical waves just yet. However, let's take a look at this real quick. We've all seen this. I'll show you for the sake of this discussion. And I think we are in a safe place where I can do that and nobody gets upset about it. Look, you go out into time past the week mark. There's 168 hours. Once you get further out in time from that, yeah, the GFS spins up a hurricane brings it right into the Gulf Coast. And depending on what run you look at, this is the overnight run last night. This is the 12Z run today. And you go back even further. This is yesterday, so forth and so on. It's been doing it way out on that long time frame for quite a while. And this is a known bias of the global forecast system. This is one operational model. Now, people say, oh, that's because it's garbage. No, that's not necessarily true. You know, think about it this way. If you're standing just a few feet from the basketball goal and you're trying to make a basket, the odds are really good, even if you're a terrible shot overall, not in good shape, whatever. As long as you're tall enough, you're probably going to make a high percentage of those shots because you're close in. The farther back you get, unless you're Steph Curry or somebody, the harder it is to make those shots. It's going to be, become more random. But every once in a while, Somebody will walk into a gym, and they might be at the opposite end of the court, and they'll chuck it, and it'll go right in, nothing but net. That's such a random thing. That's kind of like the GFS. Once in a while, those long-range forecasts will end up being correct, but not for the reasons that you think of. You know, like you just got lucky, so to speak. But what it does show us, and I was talking over text with my friend Dylan Federico about this, the model is indicating the operational and its ensembles and the euro and its ensembles to at least some extent that something could start to happen down in this area uh, as we get into the first week or so of June. Not necessarily that there's going to be some powerful hurricane coming up. It's been since, what, 1986 or something like that? It's been a long time since we've had a June hurricane landfall. I'm going to be honest. That might even not be right. I don't know. That's how long it's been. But remember, too, it's not hurricanes that we're just worried about. Any tropical system coming up here can give us impacts, and that's what we really need to be focusing on. So let's just look at this uh, from an analytical point of view from a couple of folks here on the Twitter. This is Andrew. I had the pleasure of meeting him in person at the wonderful Swizzle Inn last year when Ernesto was headed for Bermuda, and um, several of us had dinner there. So I got to meet him in person. It was really nice, but that's neither here nor there. I just like to proclaim, hey, I finally met the guy. Uh, but he knows what he's talking about, and he too sees this as, look, don't put too much stock in it. The Genesis pathway is through a sharp upper level trough, which does happen, but almost never as quickly and as cleanly as the GFS is showing. It's like way out in time, the GFS can latch on to some energy and it just runs wild with it. You sort of get that chaos theory. At some point, I really would like to get one of the modelers, one of the people that works on this kind of stuff, 
on a special edition of our Hurricane U series. It's been a while since I've done one of those. And ask them straight up, why do the global models do this? Because the Euro will also do it sometimes. Farther out in time, further out in time, whatever the correct terminology is, the model just kind of loses its mind, if you will. And then we get people posting 10 and 12 day forecasts of one snapshot, and then they tell you, oh, it's just something we'll watch. Great for engagement, not very useful for anything other than, all right, it's hurricane season coming. And I'm not knocking people to do that. Hey, do what you want, but understand it's probably not going to happen. Just like if you take that shot from 94 feet, it's probably not going to go in. But that's not the same as, we call it a non-zero chance, all right? Zach Covey also picking up on this as well. He says, I know what the deterministic runs are showing. Again, we all do. We've seen them out here. But I'll bet on the GFS undersampling the ridging every single time. And he's right. The East Pack does look more favorable with the upcoming MJO Pulse. Now, we do have a favorable window coming through. That's why I say this is a non-zero chance. But I don't think it's going to be within the next week. You know, probably further out in time than that. You know, so it's just a symptom. we got to watch and see that eventually something like this might come to pass. Sure, but is it going to be 12Z Monday morning, June the 9th? That's 8 a.m. Eastern time. I'm going to take my bets in Vegas that no. But there might be something brewing at that time, just not like this. All right, we just got to pay attention. Of course we do. It's almost hurricane season. And the Gulf, very warm relative to average and in reality, Look at this, already knocking on the door of 30 degrees Celsius, if not there already, right along that shallower shelf water of the Florida Peninsula, very warm everywhere else, you know, 28 Celsius, there's your 29 isotherm right there, nice and toasty, and yes, the Gulf is warmer than average, we've talked about this a lot, especially in the Northeast Gulf, talking 3, 4, 5 Celsius warmer than normal, and hey, even the water temperatures in the Southwest Atlantic over here running quite a bit above the long-term average. But while I'm here, let me point out a couple things. Look at these nice little instability. Kind of looks like what the atmosphere will do because, look, the uh, the ocean is just a thicker version of the atmosphere if you think about it. So you have these different patterns that show up with how the ocean is like a conveyor belt down there. But look at the limited anomalies in the East Pack. I'll just start over. Not a lot of real estate. I was pointing this out the other day of positive anomalies and again, that might play into a more active hurricane season. We'll see. I, th you know, I think that might have a little bit of, of merit because what doesn't happen here usually makes this more favorable when things naturally become favorable. And sometimes they're not. Sometimes that window is closed. And uh, I think that's the way it's going to be as we start the season. And this is a big part of it. I'll leave you with this thought here. Well, I got a couple of thoughts after this, but the last of my tabs for you anyway uh, TAF B, Tropical Analysis Forecast Branch at the Hurricane Center, down there in beautiful Miami. Uh, look at that huge area of dust right off of Africa. And I know I say it too much too. It's not just the dust. It's, you know, the dust helps us see the underlying Saharan air layer. And I'm going to tell you what, you just look at that pattern. Look at all those low clouds, that stratocumulus layer. Anybody that knows what they're looking at, you look at that, you go, that's stable, no good for hurricane air. That is Saharan air that has ejected off of Africa with the uh, strong jet out there. And it's going to look, you can even see the way the, the streamer is coming off the islands down here. The trades are pretty brisk. And this will keep things quiet out here for the foreseeable future. And then you have the graphical version of it, the dust aerosol optical thickness forecast as you move out into time or the analysis anyway there it is um, yeah this stuff's all tracked and kept an eye on by various organizations and we look at it and we can say hey things should stay nice and quiet for the foreseeable future so before I let you go uh, I, pu I put this on Twitter earlier today had a great visit with Fox weather yesterday up in New York City the hospitality that they showed me all the meetings I went to the people I got to interact with a couple of hits I did with Ian Oliver boy just incredible the time went by it's one of the only times I've been in an office nine to five I mean because this is my office I mean you get it that's literally in a big office building there in Manhattan 
Uh, and that was fabulous. But what I really, really want to like brag about, because I'm a big believer in ride share, Lyft, Uber, whatever, all the creature comforts to make travel easy. This time around, I chose very like willingly, I want to try public transit and see how it works. The trains, the buses, whatever. Flew into LaGuardia, stayed in Brooklyn, took the train in, subway, whatever you want to call it, to Manhattan and back. And for the most part, the, the first leg trying to get from LaGuardia to my hotel took a little bit longer than I wanted because I didn't understand there's an R train that goes this way and there's an R train that goes that way or whatever. And sometimes at night it's different. Once I figured it out, A, it worked like clockwork. It was remarkable. B, it saved me a ton of money. I know people make money doing the Lyft and the Uber, but one Lyft was like $67 to go like a 38-minute drive, and the train, $2.90. Come on. It's just smart, and it worked, and I got to see, didn't really meet anybody because you don't really talk, I guess, on the subway, but I got to see some very interesting people, uh, especially that first night that it took me a little over two hours to get from LaGuardia to my hotel because I was figuring it out, but I saw Spider-Man, I guess after he finished his shift in Times Square, he didn't look real happy, and Mickey, Minnie Mouse, Elmo, whatever, all those characters, and a few people that, I don't know, they might have been in the cast of The Walking Dead at some point, that's all I'm going to say, but everybody else was, you know, fantastic, That it wasn't scary or anything, it was great, so look, if you're going to New York City, and you have the choice, and you can take public transit, do it, it works, you just got to figure out the spaghetti models, as I called it, of the mapping system up there, because that's what it looks like. Once you get the R's, the F's, and the N's, and the Q's, and all the buses figured out, you're good to go. All right, so there you go. That's my uh, my helpful travel tip for you as we head into the weekend. Hey, look, from all of us at Hurricane Track, I'm Mark Sutter. Thank you for tuning in. I will see you again on Monday.